Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank Andy Siegel for that really very warm and uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you. I, I appreciate it very, very much. And I want to thank uh, my friend Mike Taylor and my daughter Jessica for doing a great job on that video. Really excellent, excellent job. I don't know why I have to say anything more. I kind of like that. I, I also want to thank my daughter Jacqueline and Justin Mayer for taking care of all the logistics that they took care of getting our team here and everything that they do. And I, I appreciate uh, that very much as well. And I, I want to thank my great friend, Jay Rokich, for coming up from Miami and uh, entertaining us and being the MC. It's always great having you up at camp and it was great having you here tonight. Thank you, Jay Ro. I want to also, I want to also recognize Molly Hott and the chair of SCOPE, Mitch Ryder, for the excellent work you do, and the entire board, the dinner committee, the entire team from SCOPE that helped put this event together and do so much all year long for SCOPE. Thank you all for what you do. I also want to congratulate Maddie Lehman. Appreciate your words so much, and the same back to you. You're a great leader. You're going to do so much more in terms of great things, and you're a great asset to Indian head camp, and uh, I wish you all the best. It was great tonight. And the Jefferson Awards Foundation, you do magnificent work. Uh, my congratulation to you as well, and to Camp Taconic uh, for uh, what you do and have done for, for SCOPE as well. I have uh, a number of people to thank, and rather than do that out from up here and take an awful lot of time, after I'm finished, if you have the chance, take a look on page 28 in the journal. And I've put a letter in and I've thanked at least some of the people that I think it's so important to thank who do, do so much to make everything that we do happen. And I appreciate uh, all of their work. Now, I will tell you that I'm the person up here who is getting the Legends of Camping Award this evening. But you should know that everything I do, whether it's in my camp life, in my political world, philanthropically, or certainly in our home, happens only because of the love, help, and support of my best friend, my wife, Mindy. And I want to thank her here to make a great team. Now, this evening, I don't think anyone here understands how complicated this is for me. Because this is like the collision of two parallel universes. You've got in the same room my camp world and my political world all at the same time under the same roof. And that doesn't ever happen and I've worked hard to keep it from happening. <laughs> and it must be much like seeing Superman and Clark Kent on the same stage at the same moment in time. <laughs> Superman, not because I'm so super, but because in my camp life, I spend every day running around doing ridiculous things dressed in exactly the same outfit. And Clark Kent, because in my political life, I spend every day, as you see me here now, looking like the stiff that most people think that I am. <laughs> so I thought tonight would be a great opportunity to dispel that image that I have. And I thought I'd come up with a story that would do that. And I have to tell you, it was very tough given these contradictory positions that I'm in. So fortunately, I have kept a journal. This is true. For the past 30 years. It was Mindy's idea. And in that journal, it's 2,000 pages of material. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's some real juicy stuff in that journal <laughs> from those summers. And one day, by the way, I'm going, to, I'm going to sell that journal. I'm going to publish that journal. And it's going to make me rich. It'll close my camp, but it'll make me rich. So I came up with a story, believe it or not, going through all of these pages from 1985 that I thought would fit the bill. And some of you who are camp people will know this story, from Timberlake anyway. But it has to do with the favorite thing that I do at camp, thing I, I love probably more than anything else, and it's a little bit crazy, but I love going out in the middle of the night 
on raid patrol, and I have the latest military grade night vision equipment that I take with me, and I have, a, I, I have actually earned a reputation at Timberlake of being excellent at this. The kids believe I'm up every night, all night, and I don't dispel them of, the, of that myth. So you have to understand that I came out of my cabin one morning to find a note taped to my door, and the note simply read, the mouse was out while the cat was asleep. <laughs> well, I knew exactly who it was, but because I hadn't physically caught him, or I hadn't found him out of his bed, you know, on a bed check, I couldn't do anything about it. But I knew who it was. You see, we had this kid in camp whose real name was Scott, and he was 16 years old at the time. He was a very good-looking, athletic kid. You know, everybody loved him, very personable. The girls just loved him, and he certainly availed himself of their affections. <laughs> and when he was a little kid, many years before he first came to us, he was eight years old, he was as cute as a little mouse, and they called him Mousy. And he kept that nickname all the way through his years at camp, through his teen years, and even beyond. So I knew who it was. And I went into the dining room that morning for breakfast, and sure enough, my suspicions were confirmed by the smile on his face. I could see that smirk. He was saying, so what are you going to do about it, you know? Well, I looked at his girlfriend at the time. Her name was Carrie, I remember. I read it, actually. And, <laughs> and, uh, and she was smiling, too. And so, I, you know, I'm not one ever to, to let a challenge go by. So for the next three nights, I set my alarm clock for 2 in the morning. I got up, I did raid patrol, I checked that kid's bed three times each night. Nothing. On the fourth night, I was exhausted, I slept. Wake up in the morning, there's a note on my door taped again. <laughs> the cat must be sleepy because the mouse was out of his house. Well, this cat and mouse routine went on for about two to three weeks. And every time, there was, every several days, there's a note. And the kids in camp are loving it, because this kid is beating me, but good. <laughs> Until one night at evening activity, I got a tip that Mousy was going to be out that night and visiting his girlfriend. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I used a paid informant. <laughs> You'd be surprised how far two Brio's pizzas get you <laughs> in terms of getting information. And so what I did was I got... I got the girls' head counselor, and I got the uh, OD for the girls' bunk after the girls all went to sleep. We went up to the teen girls' building. I made sure, they, they went ahead, made sure everybody's properly attired, and then I entered the building. I went right up to Carrie, his girlfriend, and I said, Carrie, I hear you're not feeling very well. She said, oh, no, I'm perfectly fine. I said, no, no, let me see. And I put my hand on her, on her forehead, and I felt her forehead. I said, oh, no, you're burning up. You've got a fever. You've got to spend the night in the health center. So I had the OD escort her out to the health center. I then got the girl's head counselor. I said, you stand behind that door. And I turned off the lights, and now the trap was set. I climbed into Carrie's bed. I laid down on my side with my back facing the door. I pulled the covers over my head, and Quite frankly, I fell asleep. <laughs> At about two in the morning, two in the morning, I feel someone sit down on the bed. I open my eyes. And then I have a hand shaking ever so gently my shoulder. Slowly, I pull down the covers as I turn to face him, look him right in the eye, and I said, meow. <laughs> Now, that story, that story hits every time. I got to tell you, it's the it, exa same exact reaction every time. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want, to, want you all to change your paradigm from my camp world and enter my political world. You can't imagine the front page of the New York Post, Democratic chairman crawls into 16-year-old girl's bed. <laughs> Now, now, you see, now you see and you understand my problem. 
This will be my 57th consecutive summer at sleepaway camp. It'll be my 52nd summer at Timberlake, and I was 24 years old back in 1980 when I bought the camp. I was the youngest director in camping. It was before there was an award called the Legends of Camping, but believe me, not before there were legends, true legends in this profession. And I have to tell you that I had the privilege over quite a number of years of working with and being with and getting to learn from some of these legends, and I learned an awful lot. And when I think of legends, I think of people like Maury Stein and Ben Applebaum. They were two of the most forward-thinking, generous people you could imagine. They transformed both the profession of camping and the business of camping in ways that we now just take for granted. They were so generous, always raising money for one cause or another to help children get to camp or for any other cause they could find that benefited kids or the camp profession itself. And you never said no when Maury or Ben asked you for money. I'll tell you that. I remember one time in particular, I don't remember the cause. Ben Applebaum called me on the phone and asked me for some money for something or another. And I said to him, how much should I give? And he gave me an answer that I, have, I remember to this day. He said, give as much as you can. Give until it hurts, and then give some more. And that's how they lived. That's how they were. Both of them left us way too soon. But I will tell you that I owe them a debt of gratitude for not only the friendship that they shared, but the wisdom they imparted in the time that we had. I miss them both. I will also tell you that while particularly the camp professionals here, while the opportunity to learn from and be with legends like that has been lost to time. If you want to get a taste of what it was they had to offer, just an idea, learn some of the things that they had, you can still do it because there are people in this room and around who learned from them as well. Giants, people like Doug Pierce who's here with us tonight and is a giant in camping. Scott Rawls, Andy Pritikin, Dawn Ewing. Dawn is the director of Project Mori, and I gotta tell you something, she's about as close to a saint as the camp profession has. Dawn Ewing deserves all of our appreciation. Jack, Jeff Ackerman and Skip Vickness, Dave and Shelley Tager among them. And of course, Maury's son, Tony Stein. I also recommend that you spend a little time with someone who isn't a camp director, but has done so much to really just advance the profession of camping. And that's my friend, Bob Ditter, who in my mind is every much bit a legend of camping. I have two passions in life aside from my family, camp and country. And they come together very well in the form of scope. And I'd like to tell you why for a few moments. J. Rowe was right. I was not an ideal camper when I got to camp. My parents sent me to camp when I was just six years old. I was homesick and I didn't much like it. I was also the unathletic fat kid in the bunk. Not a particularly good position to be in back in the days when the term bullying actually had some real physical pain associated with it. When I was nine years old, on the last day of camp, I remember the buses coming back to the spot in Queens where we, we uh, got off, and I was told that my mother no longer lived with us, that she had left to start a new life, unencumbered by children. And that's when I think I first got the idea that life has its bumps, and it does. After that, camp became for me as much my home as any other place. That's when I began my lifelong practice of counting down the days until the start of camp. 72, by the way. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people will say that camp is just a great 
fun recreational getaway for kids. That so misses the point. I believe that I am a better person because my father chose to and could afford to send me to camp. Camp teaches, skill, teaches kids the skills of making and keeping friends while building their self-esteem, their self-confidence, and their resilience. Camp teaches values, camp builds character, and it's those social skills that form the foundation for creating a happy and successful life. Now, I teach the kids at camp that I believe that everyone is an important part of everybody else's summer. It's so true, if you think about it. It's like players on a team. It's, it's really the essence of camp. The dynamic of camp is all about the shared experience, isn't it? And that's actually the way I see life. It's the way I've always seen life. Each of us is enriched or in some way impacted by this common journey we are all on. That's why we feel it and we care so much when we hear that bad things happen to people we don't even know, haven't even met. Doesn't make a difference. In some fashion, we're all connected. And as somebody who loves history and politics, for me, it's as much about the American experience as it is the human experience. America is not so much a place on the map defined by lines and borders as it is an idea, a great idea, whose reality is yet to be perfected. It's the idea of freedom and justice that's given us this great American dream of hope and opportunity that attracted so many millions of people to our shores and still does. And it commits us to the shared belief that the benefits of America belong not just to a few of us, but truly to all of us, no matter where we're from or when we got here, no matter what we look like or what we believe, no matter who we love or where in this country we live. And each of us, everyone in this room, shares in that heritage and in the commonality of that journey we call the American experience. So I guess it wasn't so much of a leap back in the late 1980s when we began reading stories of kids in our inner cities falling victim to gang and drug violence, getting shot and killed just standing on the street corner, typically in the summer, that the idea came to me that maybe camp should be their home too. You know, kids in these communities had it tough. Almost 50% failed to graduate from high school. Less than 40% went off to college. And only 11% ever actually attained a bachelor's degree. Unlike ours, their parents had no place to turn. Society was failing these kids. And they weren't able to get their peace and their chance at the American dream. And just as bad, America was not meeting its full potential. So in 1991, with not-for-profit camping in decline due to a lack of funds, with uh, beds sitting empty and idle, it just seemed like the perfect coming together of two problems in search of a common solution. So under the auspices of the American Camp Association, with a couple of great camp directors like Doug Pierce, and some non-camp leaders like Henry Skyer, and my close friend, Sandy Lavitt, uh, we decided to create SCOPE and just look at what's happened and what's been accomplished since then. When I try to tell people what the essence is, really, what, what is it all about that you're doing when you support SCOPE? I think back to a movie that I saw back in the late 1970s. Most of you probably are either too young or, or didn't see it, but, but for me, it, it it said something, and it was, the movie was called Oh God. And the premise of that movie was that God, played by George Burns, returns to Earth to enlist the support and help of a simple good man, John Denver, to spread his message of hope to the people of the world. Now, I have to tell you, that movie represents the entirety of my religious education. But at the end of the movie, after all sorts of trials and tribulations, 
John Denver meets up with God for one final time. And he's complaining. He said, what did we accomplish? Nobody believed what I had to say. Did we get anything done? Did it make any difference at all? And God answers him by asking him a simple question. Are there enough apples in the world? He says. And then he goes on. I found one good man, Johnny Appleseed. I gave him some seed and I told him to go out and plant. You never know what seed will take. You never know what will grow. But one day, you turn around and you look back and what do you see? A world full of magnificent, beautiful apples. That's what we're doing with scope. We're planting seeds. So at a time when it seems that government is taking a step back in the fight for economic and social justice, it's up to us, the people, to step forward, as we always have, and continue lifting up those who have the least among us. And we do that by remembering the words of Ben Applebaum. Give as much as you can, give until it hurts, and then give some more. You know, my friends, these are dark days in American history, and they're dark days for many people in our country. For too many people, they've been dark for way too long. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that only in moments of darkness can we see the stars. Well, through scope, we get to not only see tomorrow's stars, we get to create them. If you give, if you give a child some self-confidence, a nurturing environment, the embrace of great friends, give them some hope and the capacity to dream and dream big, then together we can and will change a life, change this great country of ours, and change the world. Thank you all for what you do, and thank you for honoring me here tonight. <laughs>